ba? Authorized causes of uh, termination of employment as well as just causes of uh, employment termination. So, among nice. those, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a standard appeal to the civilians, plus an additional negligence, fraud, and the breach of trust and confidence, uh, commission of crime uh, against the person of the employer or risk of assemblies, and analogous cases uh, as may be provided in the company rules and regulations as well as analogous to those of the items I earlier mentioned. Then you also have authorized causes of the terminating employment wherein you have grounds such as uh, redundancy, you have, uh, you, you have a closure of establishment, you also have instances wherein you will have to reduce manpower, what we call as uh, 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 you have to reduce manpower also in so far as uh, the operational requirements are concerned. Now, you also have grounds such as uh, health reasons as well as uh, forced death and retirement as grounds of termination. So these uh, grounds of termination are important to know because uh, these are the only basis by which employment can be uh, legally terminated in the Philippines. You cannot uh, terminate uh, the employment of what other than those provided under the labor code. And uh, if and when there are other grounds that may not have been provided by the labor code, then you will have to reconsider uh, terminating the worker because at the end of the day, you may end up being, uh, the dismissal may, may end up being declared as illegal. And therefore, the consequence thereof is uh, necessarily the uh, reinstatement and uh, payment of back wages. Now, there has been a new rule implementing the labor code so far as termination of employment is concerned. That is Department Order 147-15 or 147 series of 2015. This involved the uh, termination of employment that has been identified already earlier. But the Department of Labor actually uh, further uh, ramified the basis by which you can terminate employment. So in this department order, the grounds of termination of employment has been dissected into several elements. Now, please note that uh, all of these elements need to be proven uh, if and when you need to ter uh, if, if and when you terminate the employment because uh, this is one of uh, these elements are part and parcel of the substantive due process that is required by law. So I, I just forgot to mention earlier that uh, in termination of employment, you need to have observed both substantive and procedural due process. So in terms of procedural due process, Department Order 147-15 is the newest issuance of the Department of Labor, which may be used as a guide in termination of employment. But you have to take note also that there are certain provisions there that may not have been in accord with the prevailing jurisprudence. One of which is uh, determination of employment on an authorized process for closure of establishment. Uh, one of the elements or requirements for you to prove the determination of employment to closure of establishment is that the closure of the establishment need to be the last option to be uh, exercised by the owner. But then again, under prevailing, prevailing laws and jurisprudence, wala namang sinasabi sa batas na kailangan malugi ka o uloy na yung option na yun. You can actually quit the business, stop the business, even if you are doing well. Kung ayaw mo na, po pwede rin. So you may want to take note of those. So uh, I guess uh, that's essentially the most basic uh, items that I want to share so far as Employment termination is concerned. Now, so far as uh, yung mga mas malalim na mga issues regarding that, I guess uh, I would uh, defer that discussion to Attorney Sessions, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Attorney Sessions, good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to uh, say that I am here to guess. I'll be expressing views that are not uh, reflecting of the views of female for any of its communities. Uh, I am here as an independent academic. I would like to supplement 
the topic started by turning web. Turning web was this. After the need for a course, it's axiomatic that this means that employees in the Philippines should be conform, should, should conform with due process. It's just two aspects. The substantive and the procedural. And the substantive aspect of due process it simply means that the dismissal of employment termination must be based on a valid legal cause. And as Attorney Mowen said, the process are a just process of the authorized process under the uh, labor code. As, as to the procedural aspect of due process, we know the uh, two notice law, where the employer has to be given all opportunity to explain the side, and later on, the explanation is unacceptable, then the second notice will be issued, which is the decision of the management. The point I would like to add is this Is this visa at will valid in the Philippines? In the U.S., there is what we call, there is, there is what is called EAW, Employment at Will. An employment at will can be terminated with cause or without cause. There is no need for cause. That's the reason it is called employment at will. The employment lasts as long as the party, the parties will it. Is employment at will, termination without cause, valid in the Philippines? No way. But there's one exception. As a rule, there is need for a valid cause. But the Supreme Court recently came up with a decision involving an OFW working abroad, where he was terminated without cause, simply by the employer say that the employer is terminating the employment of the Philippine work. The case was filed. The case of illegal dismissal was filed by the worker when it came to the Philippines. So one of the big issues was is this visa abroad of an OFW even with a force a valid termination? The Supreme Court came up with an answer. We applied the Lex Loxy Contractus to its court. The law applicable is the law of the place where the contract is accepted. The contract of the complaining OIW was uh, accepted, if I remember correctly, in Ethiopia. And in that contract, uh, it is allowed for either party to terminate the contract for no for, for, for a cause or even for no cause at all. Supreme Court said if the employment contract is signed in a foreign country where EAW employment will is recognized and assuming that that contract involving an OFW is signed uh, with full consent, knowingly, by the worker, then the law applicable is the law when the contract is signed. And considering the free consent of the employee, the employee can be dismissed even without cause. In other words, EAW, Employment Act, is not valid if executed in the Philippines, involving one who is working in the Philippines. But EAW, involving a Filipino worker, working in a foreign country, where EAW is recognized, then EAW is valid. And the termination based on the provisions of an EAW employment contract is recognizable in the Philippines. I go to another point. The department order mentioned that only in the regarding Book 6 has a new provision. In addition to the specifications of cases that are cited as examples of just causes, 
I am concerned, and I am talking about the rule in 147.15 that in so far as analogous causes are concerned, the analogous cause cited by the employer as a reason to terminate employment of an employee, that analogous cause must be stated in an existing company policy. I beg to disagree. I think that analogous cases cannot be anticipated and embodied in detail in company policies. The reason analogous cases are cited in Article 97 is precisely to leave leeway and go room for cases that are not squarely fallen under any of the cited just causes in Article 297. Analogous case simply means something similar. Now, in real life, you cannot anticipate everything similar. Therefore, the requirement in 147.15 is, is either superfluous or ultraviolet. It's beyond the authority of the Department of Labor to tell an employer, to tell an employer that, hey, if you are using an analogous cause as a reason to dismiss, that analogous cause must be mentioned, existing expressly in your existing company policy. It's almost impossible because analogous case cannot be anticipated all in detail. And that requirement, I think, borders on the impossible. I would like to point out also in relation to what Attorney Noel said. The question about violation of company rules. 297 mentions serious misconduct and will for disobedience as valid just causes of termination. Now, it has not been squarely cited by the Supreme Court. Whether or not ignorance of the policy by an employee is a legal excuse, meaning to say, if an employee invokes ignorance of the policy of the company allegedly violated by the company, can the ignorance of the employee exculpate him? In other words, is ignorance an excuse? Can an employee be dismissed from his job if he is invoking ignorance of the policy unless it has been violated? We are aware of Article 3, Civil Code. Ignorance of the law excuses no one from complying with the risk. If you apply this provision of the Civil Code, the answer to the question of whether ignorance is an excuse is most probably not. Ignorance does not excuse its violation. However, it has been explained in civil law and political law. Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. It's true for public laws, laws of the Republic. But if you are talking by law or rule or policy in a private enterprise violated by, a, by, by an employee of that enterprise, mere violation of the policy is not enough to punish it, especially with this visa. It must be shown that the, the policy he violated is known to him. If he shows that he is ignorant of the policy alleged to have been violated, then the ignorance, if not disproved, is a, is a valid defense. In that case, ignorance will be an excuse, a justification. So, going back, is ignorance of a company rule invoked by the employee and the employer is unable to disprove the ignorance. What will, what will happen? 
employee cannot be dismissed. The employee who is able to show that he did not know the policy he allegedly violated is presenting a valid defense. And the challenge is for the employer to disprove the so-called ignorance. If the employer is unable to disprove the ignorance of the employee, then the employer cannot dismiss the employee. In other words, as the Supreme Court that violation of company rules must have certain elements. The rule is legal and reasonable, willfully violated, and number three, is the policy or rule has been made known to the employee. In short, give the employees the information they need. It's a job of management. It is not for the employees to look for the rules. It is for the manager to give out the rules. The employer lays down the policy and makes known the policy. It is not for the employees to look for the information that they need. So that's one point that I think should be clear. Although it is true that willful, willful violation of company rules is a just cause, you have to show that the employee knows the rule if the employee is invoking ignorance of the rule. The ignorance of the employee, if not disproved by the employer, becomes a valid defense, and for that reason, it cannot be dismissed. That's all for now, for ST. Uh, <clears throat> let me just uh, uh, add up to the discussion of the premises. Um, it's really more on the, because we're talking now of uh, the, the, the jobs of dismissing an employee, but uh, then again, uh, security tenure does not necessarily only mean that you cannot terminate the employment without just cause, authorized cause, meaning it only deals with termination, but it also deals with acquisition of security tenure itself. Because you have to acquire security tenure first before uh, the dismissal can be considered as illegal. <clears throat> now, but talking about security tenure, we know for a fact that uh, there are different kinds of employment uh, arrangements in the Philippines. For one, we have regular employees, then you have probationary, you have project employees, you have casuals, you have fixed period employees. And you also have uh, other forms of employment, such as uh, consultants, for instance. Now, I, I would like to give more emphasis now on certain issue that is, if I may say, uh, very timely at this point because of the release of the uh, Department Order uh, 174, series of 2017. This is in relation to rules governing contracting and subcontracting. Um, if you recall, uh, this rule took effect uh, April 3 this year, <clears throat> and in that, uh, in the rules, it mentions about security and tenure of the contractor's employees, such that the rules now, so far as contracting is concerned, is that contractors should accord their workers regular employment status when they have attained such. When, uh, when is regular employment status a thing? One, uh, for instance, if the worker is hired without even specifying the uh, arrangement of the engagement, meaning uh, and uh, without even stating the contract was or fixed uh, period or probationary, then the default is that he is regular. Second, you have probationary six months. Then you also have the casual employment regime, there is a one year requirement uh, of uh, tenure accumulation before the worker becomes registered. Having said that, uh, the other end of the road is actually on the issue of when are these contractors employees, uh, when can they be terminated? 
Dari mana? Kuantan di mana tak kontrak per enterprise kita terminated in relation to the contract and the services being provided by the contract. Now, under Department Order 18-8, the one being replaced by DO-174, the terminus uh, work arrangements was, been, uh, was allowed, meaning that a contractor then was allowed to hire in workers for the purpose of serving the contract that was forged between the contractor and the principal and that the tenure of the worker is actually coterminous with the service agreement between the principal and the contractor. So that uh, when this was this department order was issued back in 2011, uh, the arrangement of uh, the end of the end of arrangement was actually in effect uh, promoted or proliferated. And uh, we had situations then where workers would have to be separated after the, the employment uh, and the service uh, contract between the contractor and the principal has reached its uh, terms. And then we had the following day because there was a renewal of the same contract or an extension of that one. Now that particular situation has been arrested by the issuance of department orders, DO-174. DO-174 expressly states that the contractor employees can attain, can, uh, should acquire security tenure. And their, sir, uh, their tenure cannot be considered to terminus with the service agreement that was forged between the principal and the contractor. Ang nagiging situation ngayon is, or the default is that kung meron kang contractor, dapat yung tanyang mga magagawa should be regular to the contractor. Otherwise, that would be in violation of DA 174 and actually it is a violation of uh, the labor code provisions pertaining to security tenure, regular employment. Uh, for instance, if you may add to that. We are now on 174. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, uh, I have some great doubts about DO number 174. But while I say this, I must reiterate that I have highest personal respect to the Secretary of the Benjamin of the Bills, etc. I am going to express objectively my major observations about DO number 174. Number one, I am afraid of the long term effect of DO number 174. DO number 174 approach, DO number 174 is the wrong approach to job contracting. The right approach is the one being pursued by DPI and by Mr. Joe Construction. The support is small. Uh, region enterprises. In other words, what I'm saying right now is that there seems to be a need for coordination between DPI and DORE. DORE restricts job contracting. DPI promotes businesses, even small business ventures. The DPI approach to my mind is the right approach. The DO-174 approach, I'm sorry to say, is in the long run bad. Bad for the economy, bad for business, because it restricts the creation of business. It therefore restricts the creation of jobs. And what restricts the creation of business, what restricts the creation of jobs, is a typo. In the last analysis, the objective about objective of the was before to assist workers stabilize their jobs actually is being contradicted by the ones before. Because if you restrict the creation of business ventures and make them start 
as job contractors. If you restrict that approach, you are not helping the growth of this of business and of the country. I was reading the other day chapters on economic history of the US. I was precisely looking for a rule, a policy, or a Supreme Court decision similar to how we are now handling job contracting. Where we are restricting job contracting, the Supreme Court of the United States allowed and even encouraged what was called in the 1800s, what was called putting out which is now the equivalent of contracting out of In other words, what I'm saying is that the richest country in the world started not by restricting setting up of businesses. It is rather by encouraging, liberalizing the setting up of businesses. Under 174, what do you say? Under 174, You've got to be a multimillionaire before you can be a job contractor. Is that helping business? <clears throat> Let's say I have a shop. I'm an expert aircon mechanic. And across the street is a big building with hundreds of aircon units. I cannot contract out the repair of those aircon units because I don't have five million. Why do I have to be a multimillionaire to end up to be a job contractor? Let us say I have a book publishing company, B. And part of my business is not only to print books, but also to buy books. As a big publishing company, I had a big book by the department. But there are many occasions where if, let's say 10,000 copies of a book has been printed, it has, they have to be bound. How long would it take my book binders in my book binding department to finish 10,000 books? But just across the street is a book binding shop with five full time book binders. They have the machines and they have the expertise. Now, here I am looking for ways to finish binding 10,000 books within a given time. And I can see from experience, I cannot finish this in one month. And by that time, perhaps, the parang sums are waiting for the semester has opened. Okay, now I see across the street this is binding shop. Now that binding shop, it's five book binders, expert book binders can do the job, or is part of the job. Now, one said before, does not allow me to do it. I cannot go across the street and contract that book by the shop. Hey, I have 10,000 books to buy. Can you, can you buy 5,000? Can I take care of the 5,000? Hey, sir, in my way, it's not a thing. So, the only requirement for is that the book is by the book, not the money. Look at that. How, how will you support, ex, how will you support growth of a small business? How will you develop expertise? Now, a business does not go outsourcing only for cost. Lower cost may be a cost why businesses outsource, but there are many other causes why you outsource expertise. The smaller business may have expertise that you you do not have, even if you are the big the big establishment. The special machines. You, you may have you may not have a special machine that a smaller shop has. A big bakery does not always make cakes. A big bakery can contract out the making of cakes. A big hotel. With so many swinging pools. Why can't the hotel contract out the maintenance of the swinging pool? And why should the, man the maintenance of the swimming pool be backed up by a capital of at least five million? Why? 
for you have you are a school you need to transport students from home to school school to home you need transport vehicles why do you have to have a plate of vehicles to transport students why can't the school bus service be contracted out because the department order said directly related job shouldn't be contracted out why that provision in EO 74 is anti-business it does not give business free hand on how to manage their business you restrict the strategy of business you do you, you restrict the development of expertise why 74 by prohibiting contracting out of jobs directly related to the business of the principal as the effect of restricting business, I say the 174 handcuff business. It's a handcuff. And that's not the way I think business will work. And that reminds me, the Philippine Constitution expresses says the state shall encourage private investment because private investment performs an indispensable work. Not only should private business be supported, it must be given incentives. This provision of the Philippine Constitution is not being supported by Bill 174. So I'm sorry to say. In the long run, if the restriction of job contracting will continue, the effect will be very harmful to Philippine business. And as I said, when you restrict the creation of business, you restrict the creation of jobs. When you do this, you are punishing the workers. So maybe at this point we will have a five minute break. Yes. Uh, before we go into a question and answer. Okay. So before we proceed to the uh, questions, um. Attorney says here will be speaking a few more words about uh, the issue. Okay. I'd like to add something about uh, DO-174. We should note that DO-174 is an, an administrative issuance. An administrative issuance is uh, implementing uh, implementing a rule issued by an administrative body such as the Department of Labor. What I'm saying is that DO 174 as an administrative regulation cannot amend the law. The law on job contracting and the law on labor only contracting are provisions of the labor code which was issued 43 years ago in 1974. Now, you must realize, we must realize, these provisions of the Labor Code have not been changed in any way in this period of 43 years. The definition, the prohibitions, the permissions under the Labor Code pertaining to job contracting and labor owner contracting have been stood as they are since 1974. On the other hand, the Department of Labor has issued no less than six department orders to implement these uh, articles of the Labor Code from Article 106 to Article 109. So these four articles, 106, 107, 108, 109, 
have not been amended in any way by Congress. Therefore, the law standing the same since 1974 has remained unchanged and in the meantime they have been applied by the Supreme Court in so many many cases. You have so many many decisions implementing 106 to 109 of the Labor Code. Those court decisions applying and interpreting the Articles 106 to 109 are still valid and changed up to now. No department order, not even Art not even the 0174, can make a change to any provision of the Labor Code on this matter. So 106 up to 109 have remained unchanged since since its since their issuance in 1974, and accordingly. All Supreme Court decisions applying, interpret, uh, applying interpreting those provisions under Article 106 to 109 are still the same up to now. Because codal provisions, provisions of a statute cannot be changed by a department order, any circular or whatever opinion of the implementing agency. Therefore, the only one that can interpret the labor court provisions is the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court precedents, the Supreme Court decisions, interpreting and applying Articles 106 to 109 are still the same Supreme Court decisions, even if you change the department orders. Therefore, 174, Department Order 174 cannot prevail over the codal provisions cannot prevail over the Supreme Court decisions applying the unchanged 106 to 109. Okay, Ms. Yes, sir. So the first question that we have here says, are contractors eligible for separation pay and SIL if they finish their contracts? One thing must be very, must be made very clear. Every legitimate contractor is an employer. The right term to use is contractor employer. A contractor is an employer and as such is covered by the labor code. That is erased from our mind and I observe this around. There are contractors who call themselves contractors and if they, and if they don't follow labor code, they just say contractor. A contractor is an establishment recognized by law, authorized to enter into contract, can enforce contract, can hire people, but they are covered by labor code. So the law, for example, on wages, SIL, 13th month, whatever under the employment standards, and the provisions on employment tenure, the tenure of employees, regular employees, seasonal employees, project employees, fixed term, just causes of termination. All of this must be observed by every contractor. Otherwise, the contractor is violating the labor standards. A contractor employer can be punished under the labor code. Okay, the next question is, if we have consultants and they finish their contracts with us, are they eligible for separation? Mm -hmm. I think I, yeah. The next question is, D0174 section 10.B indicates contractors or subcontractors employees are entitled to separation pay. Therefore, can contractors charge the separation pay cost to the principals if, to the principal? If yes, is there a specific formula for the cost? May I? Um, the uh, what attorney says said earlier with regard to the obligations and duties of the contractor is indeed correct. The contractor's employer and being an employer, it should observe all the uh, legal requirements so far as entitlements of its employees are concerned, to include among others separation benefits or retirement benefits. That having been said, and having corrected the erroneous. Uh, 
dictum that was given by uh, DO 18-8 na mayroong coterminous employment. At ngayon, at, uh, pina, uh, pinalakas ngayon ang regular employment status recognition, the regular employment status of contractor employees. I would dare say that contractors should give regular employment status to its workers. That's number one. Now, having been given regular employment status, workers should not be terminated, the employment of this worker should not be terminated upon the completion or termination of the service agreement between the contractor and the principal. And such, hindi automatic na pagka nag-terminate ng employment ang contractor, uh, nag-terminate ang kontrata ng contractor at ng principal, at terminate din yung employment ng mga workers. It is the duty of the contractor to retain the regular employment of these workers until such time that they can no longer be redeployed or given new assignments. Now, under DO 174, iniksian yung tinatawag natin na floating status from six months, ginawang three months. But then again, <clears throat> the, re the, the duty, the obligation to provide and pay separation benefits is with the contractor. Now, the contractor dapat isisama niya yan doon sa papaktokin niya ang kanyang tinatawag na service fee. The problem now is that people or contractors are having difficulty taking away from their system yung dating sistema na binibiyak-biyak ina-itemize ang costing ng servisyo. Such that what they want to do is pass on everything to the principal. The cost of the service is actually the cost of labor, more or less, no? or mainly the cost of labor that they are incurring in so far as uh, providing the services concerned. That having been said, ang ginagawa nila, pinapasa nila ngayon yan sa principal. To me, that is wrong. Dapat, kung meron kang service fee, that should be inclusive of all the labor standards, all the occupational safety and health standards, including all entitlements, including separation pay of the workers. At uh, this I would like to repeat over and over again. Kung itong kwarto na ito ipapalinis ko, and I'm willing to pay 100,000, that should include everything to include labor costs, materials, separation pay, or whatever entitlements the workers of these contractors will do. I will not pay the contractor based on the number of people that they will deploy. Because ang binibili ko sa kanya servisyo, hindi ako bumibili ng tao, hindi ako mag... And I'm not renting or leasing a worker. I am actually buying a service from the contractor. And if I buy a service from the contractor, the contractor should give me a price that is inclusive of all his cost and also his profit. So for me, uh, in my personal view, a contractor should include in its pricing everything that is supposed to be kailangan niyang i-recover doon sa pagbibigay ng service niya. Include separation. Attorney says, uh, says, there is a follow-up question to the first one we just um, <clears throat> raised. Uh, if we have consultants now and they finish their contracts with us, are they eligible for separation pay and SIL conversion? Consultants. Consultants. If the consultant is not an employee, then the labor code doesn't apply. Separation pay is found in the labor code. If the labor code applies, it applies. If it doesn't, because the consultant is not an employee, there is no separation to talk about. So the next question is, can a company have the right not to issue COE to a dismissed employee? Certificate of employment. If you are not referring to the second notice in the two notice rule, then the answer is yes, you can give the certificate. But if we are talking of the second notice as part of the due process uh, procedure, then the notice is a uh, necessity. Uh, if I may add lam on that uh, issue. Uh, with, the, with the new law uh, on data privacy, uh, it is important that uh, the data that will be released in the certificate of employment should be in accord with the data privacy law. And that there has to be expressed consent on the part of the employee for you to be able to release information and data relative 
to its employment records with the Canada. Next question. Okay, next question. In the uh, BPO sector, we service multiple clients and at times the clients would want to remove a certain employee from their account due to certain violations that are not considered grounds for termination of employment. Uh, we have client contracts that give prerogative for them to decide who stays in their program or not. So for instance, the client no longer wants the employee in the account for a certain violation that are not necessarily terminable in nature. Can we legally put the employee on floating status most especially if he or she is a regular employee already until such time we can uh, reprofile or redeploy a different account? Um, yung, uh, the decision as to where to assign a particular employee is a prerogative of the employer. In that case, the BPO company. Now, if the BPO company has that agreement with the client, that the client will have a say in so far as who will be uh, deployed, then they have to honor that. Now, in the end, the worker cannot just be terminated because simply the client doesn't like the face of that worker. Ergo, the, uh, the worker has to be retained in the payroll of the company. Now, there has to be an earnest effort, even if the, uh, the worker is being placed under floating status or for a period of not more than six months. There has to be an earnest effort or earnest efforts on the part of the employer to redeploy this worker in some other accounts, in some other work, where his uh, technical expertise, his training uh, is uh, also at par with the requirements of that uh, job. Otherwise, uh, the provisions of the labor code relating to the uh, floating status of six months uh, will simply be just a moro moro on the part of the uh, BPO. No? Ang ginagawa ay through floating mula for six months and then no work, no pay. In the end, we have to protect also the interests of the workers. We have to protect their means of livelihood. And as such, being HR practitioners, we should ensure that these workers also get an opportunity to be redeployed in some other jobs found within the company. Yes, sir. Yeah. Before we leave the issue of uh, contracting, I'd like to say something about NOC, labor only contracting, particularly the consequence. There is no NOC on labor only contracting unless there is a finding that NOC exists. The contract between the contractor and the contracting starts on the basis of legality and not on the basis of illegality by way of LOC. LOC is a finding that the contracting out is not legitimate or what is called illicit or licit under the 174. What I am saying is that our strategy should be to support, to liberalize, legitimate job contracting, what is traditionally called independent contracting, where the contractor is a businessman in his own right. He has his own business, he manages his business, he capitalizes on his business, he has people, he has an expertise, he sells his business to the world, he's a full-fledged businessman. That's why a valid contractor is a valid contractor employer. Where did we get this NOC? They were only contracting. This was invented by the writers of the Labor Code in 1974. There was no labor only contracting before 1974. Labor only contracting in itself is a self contradiction. How can you be? A contractor, if your business is only to supply people, contracting is contracting to do a particular specific job or project. If you are merely supplying people, then you are a recruiter and you are not a job contractor. You cannot even be called contractor. You should be called recruiter. Now, LOC, labor only contracting, is self-contradictory because it is a recruiter posing as a contractor. 
and then you call him the contractor. No, he is not a contractor in the first place. He is just a supplier of people. All right. When there is a when there is a finding of NOC, what happens now? Well, we say that the so-called contractor, the labor-only contractor, is an agent of the principal, the contracting. And then what happens? The people hired by the so-called contractor are classified or considered as employees of the client, of the contracting. In short, this is the country, perhaps the only country, where the client becomes the employer. Point to me a country, at least in Asia, where the consequence is the contractor is set free and the contractee is punished by making him absorb all the employees of the so-called contractor. Under present laws interpreted by the Supreme Court, when there is a finding of NOC, the contractor is considered an agent of the contractee, meaning the principal is declared as the employer of the employees of the contractor. Where, again, I was reading economic history, never, never in the history of the U.S. was there such a law where the employees of a contractor were transferred wholesale to the payroll of the client. This happened to a big company here in the Philippines and just very recently to 9,000 employees told to be absorbed by PLDT. This is anomalous where a contractor is set free from his obligations to the people that I had because those people are transferred as employees of the client contracting. This is anomalous. It does, not, it does not promote responsible contracting. It does not promote ethics because the one who incurred the obligation had simply to transfer those obligations to the shoulders of the client, but who he, what he was supposed to serve. So this is unethical and anomalous and I say that this is anti-growth. It does not help the growth of business and therefore of the economy. And I go back to my thing. If you make things hard for business, you are not just punishing business. You are punishing the workers. Okay, so a few more questions are coming in, but it's 11.07. And yet we can accommodate at least two more questions okay. for you, right? So First one is, in conducting administrative hearing, can the principal and contractor conduct joint investigation? Can this, stipula can this be stipulated in the service agreement? Um, I would like to correct that concept. No? The contractor cannot, uh, rather the, the principal cannot uh, jointly conduct the investigation with the contractor. The principal may submit its own uh, fact-finding, uh, result of its fact-finding because probably the offense was committed within its premises, but it cannot conduct administrative investigation and uh, summon the employees of the contractor. Or even in that particular case, have a joint uh, administrative investigation because that uh, discipline, employee discipline is one element of or one batch of employer-employee relationship. So your fourfold test na tinatawag ng employee-employee relationship, control, supervision, that's one. You have payment of wages, you have uh, hiring, and then termination of disciplinary action is another batch of employment. Okay, so one last question, attorney. We had a messenger working for the principal for more than five years now under an agency. Is the messenger considered regular to the principal or to the contractor? How will you treat the case of the agency hired employees working for the principal for more than three years now? So these are janitors, drivers, messengers, and employees. Okay. 
In the first place, as what we have earlier discussed, the contractor should have accorded regular employment status to its workers. So, dapat regular yan doon kay contractor. Now, the problem comes in is if and when yung worker mo pinagpasapasahan na ng ibang contractor, meaning this is not the first time that uh, this worker has been with you uh, and this, uh, kumbaga, minana lang yan ng isang contractor. The point being is that if you keep on retaining the same person and then transfer his employment, then at the end of the day, meron kang control in so far as hiring and firing of that personal is concerned. Now, what you now need to do is to require your contractor to show proof that it has accorded regular employment status to its workers. Anong proof yun? To my mind, it can be a letter or a memorandum addressed to the worker which the worker uh, acknowledges in writing, pinanggap niya, pinagmaha niya, stating that that particular worker has been accorded regular employment status by the contractor. And that having been said, at uh, ikukonfirm mo yan sa worker, inaffirm naman ng worker na siya ay regular doon sa kanyang contractor, then you're in safe hands. Okay, so I guess um, since we have a very limited time and um, the questions that you have posed are not easy questions, but still we must face them advisedly, whether as an HR specialist or an HR generalist, whether an upstart or a seasoned manager. So in case you have questions that were not addressed yeah. during this session, you can email us, you can visit our website, and you may type your questions um, at our help desk icon. So thank you for joining us and see you in our next webinar session. Thank you so much and uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you. Good day.